our lunchtime keynote will be presented by Susan Griffin, who is a noted author here in Berkeley. Um, her groundbreaking and pathbreaking work, Women in Nature and the Roaring Inside Her, is a classic of eco-feminist literature. I encountered it in college, and yeah, I felt like Joan is looking like, wow, this is, this is speaking to me. It was amazing. So then I was really thrilled when I moved to Berkeley many years later and, and got to be nearby Susan. Um, she has tw 20 books, um, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, A Chorus of Stones, The Private Life of War that blends history and memoir, um, as do a couple other books in that series that she calls Social Autobiography. She's won so many awards and honors. Um, she received a Fred Cody Award for Lifetime Literary Achievement from the Northern California Book Reviewers, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Northern California Book Award for Nonfiction, an Honorary Doctorate from the Graduate Theological Union, a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, a Commonwealth Silver Award for Poetry, um, her play Voices won an Emmy. I mean, Susan is just an all-around, totally accomplished writer, and I want her to have all the time. So let's welcome Susan Griffin. Some home territory for me. So good. So um, I just want to add something to uh, Alco Cora's presentation. I, I've just re recently been thinking about the word brutal, and, he, and here we are blaming the worst of human behavior on animals. Brute, you know, this is, this is, this is animal behavior. And uh, I, I, through all my writing, and I, 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 I don't think that um, that I ever believe that the worst um, human qualities came from nature; that they came from uh, our cultures, and uh, they have been constructed by a long history of exploitation and domination. So I'm going to start with a kind of. Um, um, notion that, that we're all really used to, particularly here in California, and I'm not one of those people who dishes California. I was born here and second generation California. I love California. But, um, but there is, has been a lot of this kind of, um, I, I, I might even call it false mysticism because I'm a mystic myself, but this false mysticism that tells you you can just do anything you want and everything is limitless. And that is simply not true. And it, 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 it ignores um, the gross inequalities that we have in our system due to racism and sexism and, and all kinds of isms. But um, now it's also um, it's a, it's a very damaging idea. I'm going to tell you a story uh, uh, that, that, um, that impressed me deeply. Uh, at the mo at w when it occurred to me, I was just kind of dismayed and angry. But, but later I thought this is a perfect example of the sort of wrong-headedness of, of the thinking that um, many of our business leaders have at the highest levels. I'm not talking about small business, I'm talking about corporate, corporate uh, mentalities. Um, and that is, I was at the State of the World Conference, I don't know if you know what that is, but Gorbachev organized it, and very, very different men than um, Putin. And, uh, he was trying to get people together, and he was bringing in a lot of uh, people from the New Age, and um, and some people in the New Age do preach this idea of absolute limitlessness. And, and um, I was at a, a table, we were all at sort of tables so that we could converse with, with each other, and I was at a table with a, with, a, with a mogul, he was a capitalist mogul, and he and, and I was hearing somebody speak, and something he said made me very angry, and it was because, and so I began to talk about these immense salaries that these CEOs were getting. This was back in the, in the late 90s, but that's when it started, you know, these huge salaries that the CEOs are getting. And I was saying, well, you know, I, my, my, my son-in-law and my, my daughter uh, both have college degrees, and they can't make ends meet because of their student loans. And, and these huge, at the top, these people are getting inflated, and everybody below them don't have enough to really live on, you know. And so he said, well, what would you say if, he was arguing with me, he was very congenial, very nice guy, and he said, uh, 
what would you say if, say, everybody got a decent salary and then these CEOs still got these big, huge amounts? Would that be okay with you? And I tried to say to him, that is impossible. Economic, there's, there's resources are limited. Capital is, in fact, limited. But he uh, could not hear that because he was thinking in a, a, a mindset a, 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 I, I want to say a mathematical mindset, and I have great respect for science and mathematics, but there is something that can go on in mathematics. There is, you can go on with a set of numbers infinitely. I mean, pi goes on infinitely, that number. You know, but, but in fact, that isn't true in real life. We all experience that directly in our bodies. Our, our, our lives are limited. Our time on this earth is limited. Every day is limited. The sun goes down, that's the end of the day. And the resources of the earth are limited. Um, we have a president now who, who is um, telling, you know, wanting to get rid of regula regulations and at, the, and, and, and at the same time, his whole policy uh, on tariffs uh, is uh, related to blaming the econom economic uh, inequities in this country on other countries. So that's a very elaborate form of racism, I believe. And, um, and uh, it's also uh, a, a picture that's extraordinarily as askewed. Uh, in the first place, um, uh, Americans uh, constitute about 5% of the world's population, and we, cons we consume 24% of the energy. You know. Um, we, we, we drink, we drink, we, we don't drink it, but we use 158 gallons of water daily while more than half the world lives on 25 gallons daily. So we are the, the most, we're the major consumers of resources in the world. The fault is not with other nations. The fault is within, with, is with inequities within our own system. Um, and those are fed by this notion of endless growth. There's always this kind of uh, golden pot at the end of the rainbow. You know, it's, it's a kind of mythological promise that's made, uh, particularly lately, by populist leaders. That, you know, we are, we're going to be able to give you uh, good jobs and good salaries because we'll make a lot of money. <laughs> There's an old joke uh, about, um, uh, workers at a factory and they're near the gate, uh, the, the outer gate, and in comes in, um, in Europe, in comes uh, uh, the mogul, the CEO of the company, and he's in a Mercedes. And uh, the workers say, you know, oh, damn that guy, you know, let's hope one day he ends up like us, you know, having to make him work hard all day and, and hardly able to pay your bills. And, um, but the American worker is there near the gate, and the boss comes in in a Cadillac, now they probably would be a Mercedes, and, and, and comes in, and uh, they say, and they say, one day I'm going to be like him. Hmm. It's that, you know, that, that's also a kind of myth of endlessness, of limitlessness, that's, that, that anybody can, can be on the top. No the number of people who can be CEOs and make that sort of salary is very limited. We have limited resources on the earth. So um, that, that, that the whole idea uh, of capitalism now is attached to this myth of endless growth, that we've got to have growth. And you find even people who, uh, on, in other ways, people like Gavin Newsom, whom I like and, and agree with about many things, but he believes in endless growth. He talks about growth. We've got to do this and that for go growth. Growth is not endless. Nothing on the earth is endless, except in the sense that I'll get to eventually, but not in the way that, that it's meant. The, again, resources are limited. We can't continue. If we, if we grow endlessly, we are growing only in a false sense. We're creating a bubble, and then that bubble eventually bursts, and we have an economic disaster. The bubble is either done with mathematical symbols that are abstract, or um, with, uh, I mean, there's something that, that's very obvious about our economic situation right now, where we have um, uh, all this money at the top, and people, uh, the, the closer you are to the, to the bottom, and especially if you're 
uh, have already uh, s suffered um, discrimination because you're a person of color or a woman or you're gay or whatever. You know, you're 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 uh, you, you you are having a harder and harder time to survive, and um, and that that uh, inequity is among other things profoundly irrational. The constant grabbing, the endless grabbing of resources um, has a finite end, and that is at a certain point, there are no markets. Nobody can afford to buy the products or whatever it is that you're selling, because everybody, you've, you've impoverished the, the vast majority of people on the earth, and nobody can buy your product anymore, so then there'll be a crash. The, the crashes are not irrational, the crashes are rational. The balloons are irrational. So um, uh, we're we're um, we're living in a in a sort of uh, the other thing that that, did, that, this, that these myths of limitlessness creates is a sort of myth of independence. The myth that anybody is independent. It's a sort of Daniel Boone thinking. I remember as a kid, I loved Daniel Boone. I loved the idea of being able to go out into the woods and have all my lungs on my back and just be completely independent. And of course, here I was, a scrawny little kid, completely not even able to cross the street by myself. <laughs> but it is, it is this American myth, you know, of, of absolute independence. And, um, and in that, we lose the sense of interdependence, which is how we all survive. Um, but. Um, I want to talk now briefly about limits as a uh, as a source of meaning. That um, first, let, let me just uh, mention you know that one of the things that, that our current sitting president is very enthusiastic about is destroying regulations of all kinds. So among those regulations, the the um, the uh, regulations about contaminating the air. So, you know, we have limits about, there, that's a very serious limit, how much toxicity can you breathe in without getting seriously ill, you know. Um, so it's, it's uh, I like to look at, I think it's important to look at this attitude, this position, as not only a political position, which is profoundly irrational, but being profoundly irrational as a psychological mindset. You know, the refusal to accept limitation. To, I, I'm writing a book called Strongman about, um, not only you know who, but uh, others of that ilk, and the phenomena, the political phenomena of uh, domination. And, um, where was I going with that? I can't remember. Anyway, um, uh, the, the, uh, what the mindset, I, I'm, I'm examining psychologically this mindset of the strong man, of worshiping a strong man, and of being a, a strong man. And, and of course, it it's has to be a fantasy. Nobody ever goes around never feeling vulnerable and weak. And in fact, those of us who uh, have any sort of psychological perception at all can see that these positions of uh, uh, that bullies take often are expressions of a kind of weakness, of a kind of vulnerability they haven't learned to tolerate and they can't live with. Um, so, uh, and here's where I was getting to, and now I remember where I was going. The, the, that 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 this the, the the strength is an illusion. That um, that what happens with uh, the illusion of a strong man is that um, one has to lie constantly about uh, having weakness and vulnerability, and that creates that creates a habit of lying. That creates fabricated worlds, fabricated con conditions, fabricated um, uh, realities. So one of the chapters in my book is called "The War Against Reality," and it's very easy from that mindset then to deny climate change. Because uh, I think it was Masha Gessen said, I wish I had her exact words, which was very eloquent, and I can't remember them exactly. But it says something about Trump's lying uh, doesn't have to do with uh, trying to persuade people. It has to do with controlling reality. Mm. 
that, 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 he, that he has come to believe, and others, uh, he's not the only one, that, that if you say something, you're in a position of power, you're the dominant one, if you say it, then it will be true. So you're actually controlling reality with your words. Um, so I want to talk now a little bit before I end and take questions about the uh, limits as a very rich source of meaning. We're not, we're taught that limits are something negative, you know, and you can have this unlimited life. But limits are, um, they are, uh, they hold us for one thing. They hold us. But also, um, you can look at limits as in, in actuality being a form of relationship. That if you have a limit, it's because um, there is someone else or something else that cannot be violated. You either violate it, you, you either endanger yourself, you endanger somebody you love, you endanger them, you cannot violate those limits. So that's usually what limits uh, have, have something to do with it. And, and so the, 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 in, with, with limits, you regard the not I as a thou. Those of you who know Martin Buber's work, you know, in this beautiful uh, passage in which he talks about the tree being a thou, not an it, a thou. And this would certainly be true of animals too. The, the other is a thou. It's somebody that you have a relationship with in your heart as well as your mind. So um, other, other cultures, indigenous cultures, are used to looking at the earth as uh, not only full of meaning, but in that as a relation, as kin. Um, let's look at, uh, I want to uh, quote from Robert, Robin Kimmer. Many of you may have read this book, Braiding Sweetgrass. It's a marvelous book. I recommend it if you haven't read it. And um, she talks about um, going and picking sweetgrass. And in the first place, uh, Lena, who's a Native American teacher, tells her, you always leave a gift for the plants. So she, they bring tobacco when they're making this. Always leave a gift to the plants to, and, and ask them if you might take them. Now, the, the Western uh, sensibility that has grown up, I think, out of a series of empires, going back to the Greek Empire or before, uh, you know, would look at that as madness. You're talking to a blade of grass, you know, but. Um, it's a fruitful madness. Um, then she goes on to explain that the gr that, that grass grows well when you treat it with respect and uh, the practice and the, pr and the practice, by the way, of um, harvesting wild rice is very similar with a whole different group of Native Americans. Um, so the other realm where we um, encounter this uh, I thou relationship with uh, among at least among each other and oftentimes with uh, the whole natural world, too, is in households. Now, of course, I'm not talking about households as they actually exist, but the ideals of household, the practices that are, that are recommended that are still f supposed to be followed in households. And let me just give you one example. If you are sitting around your table, I don't care if you're a CEO or president of the whole world, if you're sitting at a table, and you have been raised to be polite. If there's a big platter of chicken pieces, oh, excuse me, we're not going to have chicken. Okay. Uh, big platter of string beans on the table, then you, you take enough for yourself and you look at how many other people are at the table. And you don't say, oh, this is a woman, she's going to have less. I mean, some households do, but that's not really polite. You don't look at somebody who's a person of color and say, oh, I'm not going to give them because they don't deserve as much. You know, you, you, everybody is equal in a household, and everybody receives uh, the same portion of string beans. You don't just grab all the string beans for yourself. So it's a whole different value system that we practice in the private life in a household. Um, not everybody practices it, but that's the way it's supposed to be. The same thing happens in the arts, and I want to tell you something about, um, about uh, that I know very well, which is the, the, in the process of 
of, of writing. I often tell my students, you, well, you have to obey the form here. You can't just do what you want. You don't have this page there and do whatever you want. Sorry, but that's not the way it works. There are, you know, so what happens is you, you, if you, you say even one sentence, like you say, she came into the room. That's so simple. Well, you, know, you can do anything you want after that. No, you can't. You've established there's a room. You've established she as somebody who's an important character, if that's the first line. And uh, came is past tense. You're using the past tense. You're using the third person, so that's those two things that are affecting the grammatical style of the syntax you're using in the book. If you want to shift to an I, uh, to use first person, then you've got to do something to make that transition work. You can't just do it. You can't switch back and forth. So there, even from just a simple sentence, you've set, you've set up this form. And, um, but the good, that's, the, that's maybe the bad news in a certain sense. You constrained yourself with just this one sentence. But in fact, the good news is that those forms you set up, including grammatical form, as a matter of fact, are ancient. They're ancient. They go back generations and generations, and they're filled with ancient wisdom. And all form in the arts is filled with ancient wisdom. And even when you um, violate a form on purpose, or you, you, I shouldn't say violate, but when you, when you move beyond a certain form or you change it slightly, you're doing it within a larger work, a larger understanding of art that has been passed down through generations. And that isn't just um, understanding of craft, it's got within it a very profound wisdom. And so that, uh, that I, when you're uh, producing a work of art, uh, you are, you may not be uh, practicing catharsis. Catharsis is, 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 is a little more chaotic and doesn't include this, this wisdom in it always. But, um, but you are putting your feelings into a framework that's larger than yourself. So there is a thou there. There's I, and the thou is in the literary form itself. You're dancing with a partner, and you can't do whatever you want. And that's true of life, too. So I'll end with just this thought here, and then take questions. I want to say, what is unlimited is cyclical time. And cyclical causes and effect. Meaning that everything we do with our lives, every single thing, will reverberate infinitely. And there's your infinity, there's your limitless. It will reverberate infinitely. And finally, what follows it is that the network of connections that we are all in and holds us all is infinite. So I'm going to end with a, with a poem, which uh, in a sense is about time, and, uh, and then ask for your questions. This is a poem I wrote very recently just after turning 75, or just before, I can't remember which, but then again, I'm 75. <laughs> okay. You must locate yourself this precisely, as with a length of thread passed through a needle, or a needle passed through a cloth. I was born, and one day I will die. After saying those words, close your eyes, it is thrilling, don't you think, in the end? Inescapable and spacious as each moment grows longer. 